I want to begin with, uh, with some thoughts on academics and activism. Uh, I have been uh, telling, well, anyone who will listen, really, um, that, uh, that I am um, I'm no, I'm neither a scholar nor a gentleman. Uh, I am an administrator. Uh, that's an, uh, uh, I've been sitting uneasily with, with this professional identity for about six months now. Uh, my administrative role uh, at this university um, since the beginning of this year has uh, kind of given me a, a, a lot more insight than I thought I already had about the crisis in which um, academic organizations find themselves, you know, whether or not we're talking about a fiscal crisis, uh, a political crisis, or a, 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 a cultural crisis within the academy. And, uh, you know, as, as head of school, for example, I know that even sort of um, starting something as uh, creating something as simple or as basic as uh, a, a rudimentary form of academic governance is, 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 is difficult. In fact, it's kind of proving to be un, um, sort of impossible in these neoliberal times in the academy. And so from that point of view, you know, I come here today and, um, and, and think about how important a place like this is uh, because it is an intellectual and a reflective space. And um, I, I, I take on board everything that was said about sort of the uh, academic disconnect with, uh, with activist praxis, but I, I suppose I want to offer a note of caution um, at the outset and say that we can't allow our critique of that disconnect to dissolve into some kind of anti-intellectualism, because that is precisely the issue that we're dealing with in terms of the right-wing critique of the academy. Right? I mean, the need for our work to be relevant or applied or that any kind of theory building or intellectual work is now sort of um, irrelevant and unnecessary. And th this critique, by the way, is going to be sharpened even more if the Minister of Education has his way after the election and, uh, and um, attaches um, university funding to employment outcomes for undergraduate students, which is still on the cards. It's not talked about that much, but apparently it's still there. Um, so all of this, I suppose, sort of gives me a bit of cause to think and, you know, sort of examine shifts in my own sort of academic administrative practices as a result. And uh, I suppose one suggestion that I would have for this group is rather than, than, than rely on sort of tropes of privilege, if you will, rather than rely on the idea that... Um, that uh, uh, that we try and excavate our own privilege in order to sort of build bridges with, um, with activist communities, um, that we also, that we also um, examine our own vulnerabilities, right? that we also sort of excavate the precarity of our own labor. Uh, I, again, I tell anyone who will listen that you know, the job that I have, or, or, or any, any professorship, um, in the academy today is not the job that I thought I would have when I was getting a PhD, and that wasn't that long ago. You know, just in terms of the performance of, of our everyday labor. I realize I'm, uh, I'm off on a tangent before I've even begun, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but this is something I feel strongly about, and I'm hoping that uh, later today so that we'll be able to sort of discuss this and related issues as we figure out what, what next to do um, with this group, with this group, and how we kind of uh, protect this uh, this this precious space. I suppose the actual link with my talk is uh, is I suppose I'm arguing and uh, trying to get us to look for new forms of openness, and, and hopefully to the end of the, to the end of the talk when we talk about the new dialogic and dialogue. Uh, hopefully you'll you, you'll 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 see what I mean. Um, if yesterday's uh, keynote address by Campbell focused on what, right, what is possible, um, this talk focuses on, um, uh, on how, right? Um, uh, I'm, I am drawing, of course, from my own work, which I have located with regard to what a lot of people call the organizational turn in social movement studies, which I, I imagine lots of you in this room are familiar with. 
And my own work is sort of like drawn from some of the so this evil social movements literature, but <laughs> some of it is also sort of drawn from you know, sort of the, I suppose I have a post-colonial sensibility that that's probably a result of my own sort of biographical experience. Uh, but but in the last four or five years, I've also been working a fair amount with ideas from Chantal Mouffe, and I suppose some of that will come through later on in my talk today. Um, so. What am I actually going to talk about? Oh, and by the way, I, I don't usually use slides. Um, so at some point, there will probably be an accident with them. So please be warned. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so while many scholars and commentators locate the, the surge in contemporary global justice activism to the Battle of Seattle at the turn of the millennium, it's clear that what we call activism today sort of has changed a lot since then. It continues to register and morph and expand in very consequential ways. So if you take what people have called the Arab Spring, optimistically, uh, if you take um, movements like Occupy, or if you take the protest at, at uh, Taksim Gezi Park last year, uh, these activities aren't seen just as a continuation of events at the turn of the millennium. They are said by scholars to represent a new generation of, uh, of contemporary protests that embody collective action that is fueled by a more diverse yet intensive kind of social networking uh, that is simultaneously and substantively more diffuse but also still focused issue engagement and more provisional but still durable goal setting. So these, these movements that have been described in this way that register on this global scale are characterized what I call uh, a new dialogic. And I define this new dialogic as a technologically enabled emphasis upon connectivity, horizontal coordination, and consensus that supposedly drives activist organizing. So what I want to do in my talk today is ask some critical questions about how did we get to this new dialogic? What is it? What are its implications? How much of contemporary activist praxis does it actually explain? And I'd like to unpack it and critique this by means of work that I've done in Aotearoa over the last um, close to a decade now. So what I will do first is talk about the new dialogic and contextualize it with some work that's been done in social movement studies, drawing particularly on Manuel Castells, I think. And then I look specifically at relationships between what one might call virtual and organic kinds of uh, activism. And here I'll use Occupy as, as, as a bit of a case study. And I will conclude by outlining what I see as meaningful and agonistic kinds of dialogic openness. So that's the game plan. Let's see how we go. Um, what is the new dialogic? Um, if you follow Castell's work, you know, the, 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 back, the backdrop of this dialogic is what he would call um, in, you know, network society and informational capitalism, you know, which he expounded back in 1996 in, his, in what I like to call his Max Weber moment, right? I mean, that, 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 that trilogy of three books in the network society. And what he calls network society, he calls it the social structure that results from the interaction between um, social organizing, change, and a technological paradigm. And um, this is sort of pretty, this perspective is pretty consistent throughout his work. And he says that um, at the source of the network society was what he frames inexplicably still as an accidental coincidence in the 1970s of three independent processes and whose interaction co constituted a new technological paradigm, which is informationalism, and the new social structure, which is the network society, which are now sort of inseparably intertwined. So these three accidental coincidences are, one, the crisis and restructuring of industrialism and its associated mode of, cap uh, mode of production, which is capitalism and statism, and the new focus on information-based or informational capitalism. Second is what he calls the freedom-oriented cultural social movements of the late 60s and early 70s that emphasize personal autonomy. Um, and the third is, is the revolution since the Second World War in um, information and communication technologies. Um, so this rendition of network society, um, I could be a lot more critical of it than I'm going to be, but, but I'll, I'll hedge for now because I, I, I want to get to other stuff. 
Um, but this rendition of network society is characterized by what one might call a desire for connection. Uh, that's its logic. And that's why I'm calling it the new dialogic. Right? So there are many aspects of networking logic, but it's, as I said, it's essentially sort of the desire to move, the desire to be um, connected. Um, so I guess um, in some, you know, it, 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 in sort of a, a Castellian universe, if you will, um, there's this paradox relationship between um, activism and informational capitalism. That is, all critique of capital is imminent to capitalism. It's produced by it. Okay, and so that's something that I want to look at a little more critically down the line. So um, several scholars have looked at networking logics as they're embedded in contemporary forms of activism. I'm going to draw from them as I flesh out what I think are their implications. So the word networking is bandied about a lot. So a good starting point really is um, what is, oh, I'm already one slide behind, um, is what is uh, meant by networking. So, um, there we go. Um, networking logic, if you, if, if you look at this l long definition by, G by Jeff Juris, um, who, by the way, is a student of Castells, um, is... Um, I suppose that there are three things about this definition that I think jump out. That is, um, networking implies coordination, it implies consensus, and it implies exchange. Right? So I, I, I usually call this the CCE model of networking. Coordination, consensus, exchange. That's what it usually means, at least when it's, in terms of its semantics. <clears throat> um, so... People who work in social movement studies with this new dialogic understand three consequences as being particularly significant because of this networking logic. And um, the first has to do with organizations. Right? That the idea is that digital technologies have enabled um, activism and contentious politics to shift from the realm of formal organization to the polity at large, that is, in terms of the formation of small, short-lived, informal activist groups. And that's because of reduced transaction costs. That's because it's possible for people to reach out, coordinate, and communicate without the costs that were associated with, with, uh, um, in the era of formal organization. Uh, and this, in turn, is, um, is argued um, strengthens the agency of individual activists. A second consequence, um, a second implication, if you will, of, um, of this new dialogic is that um, has to do with what one calls thin ties that facilitate connective action. And by this, um, what's meant is that technology enables loose and flexible connections between people and issues. This, in turn, allows flexibility, decentralization, a loose association with causes, what I think Sue called mindless activism yesterday afternoon. Um, so the focus, again, is, is on what people like Lance Bennett have called connective action, that is organ organizationless action, which is distinct from organizationally driven collective action. And the third issue has to do with the complexity of framing in terms of how uh, movement issues themselves are framed and communicated. One... Uh, frame ambiguity um, and polysemy is, is, is much more complex. So people like uh, Chester and Ian Welsh, for example, have argued that contemporary global movements are successful because their global frames, the way that gl global frames and slogans are so broad and so ambiguous that they're easily personali personalizable. Right, so to a diverse range of individuals. So in the move, words of movement frame analysis, frame alignment is easier locally when global frames are more ambiguous and polysemous. So individuals with vastly different political ideologies can get involved in the same movement because the central frame or goal of the movement is, is itself vague and politically unspecified, like no war in Iraq. Okay? So making that easier for individuals to identify with and participate in the movement. Um, and... Um, as some scholars have, have pointed out, these ambiguous frames move much faster in a digital environment than, than, than frames that are politically specified. Okay? And th and another um, sort of spin-off of, of uh, this 
new dialogic is what you might call frame multiplicity. So an earlier generation of movements had uh, master frames, right, that were set by major social movement organizations. So for example, civil rights uh, has been a historic master frame for LGBTQ movements globally. Um, however, um, highly mobile or technologically infused movements don't resemble the, the, this kind of master frame structure. Rather, they, may, they, um, they are characterized more by sort of chaotic multiple and um, overlapping frames that are not necessarily particularly durable. So anyway, the, I, I've covered a lot of terrain in about five minutes. So, so rather than belabor this point, maybe you folks might have some questions about them. Let me turn to making some of these assumptions about connectivity, networking, and framing more complex and compare them with uh, what some activist organizing practices might actually look like in Aotearoa. So I'm going to draw from the very first study of activists that I did after... Um, um, after I moved here in 2005, and this was sort of a fairly traditional study, um, but, but which has actually also had some profound, some profound consequences for me personally, and uh, in the sense that I, I went around the country sort of talking to um, activists in, I think, about in, what, 60, 70 different people in, who, you know, in a, a range of activist groups. And I can count about 15 or 20 of them now as good friends of mine. You know, and there's some really interesting work that's been done in communication studies about how, really, if you wanted to engage research, then friendship should be your mode of engagement you know, with the people that you interview in terms of the, the initiation of an ongoing relationship rather than a one-hour conversation that you enter and exit and then transfer it. Right. So, um, so for me, you know, the value of this method is was realized sort of post hoc, just in terms of you know folks that I've made active connections with that I still, um, um, and who I still um, engage with. So, um, as I said, you know, there were a, a broad range of organizations that I sort of <coughs> traipsed around the country talking to, talking to people about. Um, and all of these sort of worked on global social justice in one, one way or the other. And like the rest of the movement in terms of what people have talked about, um, it's highly segmented, right? So there are peace activists, environmental activists, anti-capitalists, feminists, animal rights, socialists, anarchists, etc., etc., that spans the gamut of restorative, reformative, and revolutionary approaches to social change. So um, one question that I was particularly interested in was how folks who were organizing actually described why they were connecting with other people. And there were, of course, I, I did find this, um, some aspects of the CCE model of networking in, in this everyday activist discourse. So just in terms of folks using the word networking, saying networking is a big thing, recruiting and getting new people involved, and so on and so forth. But it was also used in a more interesting sense. So if you look at the, at, the, at, at the second quote that actually, when I was reviewing some of my notes on from the study, I pulled this out because it's really interesting in the context of uh, the emergence of MANA, right? That you know, there were activists who were, back 2005, 2007, who were saying that, well, you know, is, is, is the left too fluid, too networky to actually be a coherent party? And I think that's a, that. that there's some intriguing, I think, conclusions that could be drawn about what MANA is today and its, its place with regards to what you might call this networking logic. Um, okay, so in short, networking was a normative rhetoric that guided activist practice along the lines of horizontal coordination consensus and the free and equal exchange of information. But more importantly, there were some spatial and temporal dimensions of activist discourse that were pivotal to activist practice that were not captured by what you might call sort of dominant notions of, of networking. So here's, here's one example, proximity. You know, proximity in terms of activist organizing it, it, it is an important local feature. Right? So just in terms of where activists are located, how they're located with reference to each other, the fact that Aotearoa is small, people tend to know each other whether you like it or not. Even folks in this room, you know, probably yesterday afternoon discovered about three or four people who they know in common but didn't know they knew. 
you know, so that, you know, so the, the degrees of separation amongst uh, activist organizers in, in this country is, I think, sort of a lot smaller. I think that, in turn, makes um, organizing possibilities um, different. Okay? So, um, a, another really interesting um, aspect of activist organizing is, is, is the issue of, of continuity. Um, I haven't, I'm, I'm still struggling with that word continuity. I'm not sure it, it's, it, it's quite what um, I want to refer to. But I want to sort of, ref I, I'm, I'm using it to talk about a kind of uh, a historical sense of weakness that isn't transcendent, but that really informs how people orient themselves to each other. And actually, yesterday at lunch, I was sort of noticing that as folks were introducing themselves to each other and saying, well, do you remember, you know, talking about activists, uh, causes that they were involved with 20 years ago, realizing that they were involved in, in the same thing and knew pr pretty much the same people. So I guess, again, it, it has to do with um, proximity, but there is a sense of, a unique sense of uh, weakness that I think uh, is, is not well described by um, either the idea of coordination or consensus or exchange. So um, just to conclude, I'd say that networking logics um, or the desire to connect is always spatially and always temporally situated. It's not an abstracted, universalized, or uniform practice. And if we understand it as such, then we're likely to miss what is most vital or what is most effective about it. So in that sense, I do hold with... Uh, Van Dyck's critique of network society as being utterly two-dimensional. And instead, <clears throat> we need to understand activist praxis as being informed both by virtual, which I would understand as technological and global, as well as organic, which I would understand as local and emergent, but not necessarily non-technological. So understand that in terms of a virtual organic dialectic. And if one does that, that turns to the to, that points toward the possibility, well, I guess probability even, that activist repertoires themselves are a lot more diverse than represented in conventional social movement literature. What, after all, is a protest and who is an activist? Uh, these two terms, after all, make sense in the context of how Western politically plural societies constitute um, acceptable forms of contention and its other, which is violence. Right? So it w w was, was the Civil War activism, for example? You know, I mean, w would you call that kind of contentious politics activism? I mean, activism makes sense in a particular kind of historical epoch. And one of the things that, I've, that I find useful in order to rehearse a greater commitment to lo location and history is to consider um, not just different words that, 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 that cultures and history and, and societies use to describe contentious politics, but just a, a diverse range of practices. So for example, take the word hartal, which is a Hindi word that uh, was developed in Bengal you know, to describe a particular form of civil disobedience that resulted in um, industrial shutdowns, <coughs> in blockades, and things like the, like, like the Dandi Salt March. Like, the idea of a hartal is so much, it, it's, it, it registers, registers very differently than the notion of, say, direct action. Right? Likewise, um, how, how would one understand a hikoi? In the, you know, does one call it a protest, an event, a, a, a process? So I suppose I, I, I say all this just to, to, to point toward the dire need to, um, to animate the rather dry vocabulary of, um, of social movement studies to deal with contentious practices as they exist instead of using sort of extant categories to, to, uh, to, to, to drive our studies. So having, again, gone off on a bit of a tangent, let me get back to the question of how the virtual, uh, in, understood in terms of technology and globalization, interacts with the with the organic, which are understood in terms of local and emergent. So I'm going to do this through um, my own sort of 
observations and engagement with Occupy, both in Wellington here as well as in, um, in Montana in the United States. So one way in which I studied Occupy was not just through forms of participant observation. So I, 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 you know, when people say, did you participate in Occupy? I say, well, actually, I was a bit of an Occupy tourist in the sense that you know, friends of mine in Missoula were camping outside the courthouse, and so I joined them you know, just as a, as a form of solidarity for a couple of days, and it was cold and uncomfortable, but I did it. And then, uh, and then we were evicted. And then I came back here uh, the very next month and was in Wellington for the, the, on, on the International Day of Protest. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I did was take a lot of photographs, in addition to, to, to talking with people around me, I took a lot of photographs of, of, uh, of signs, because to me this, the, the, the signs were really intriguing in Occupy, because they were not just simplifications or condensations of political expressions, but they were also sort of, gave me sort of a, a sense of what issues people were actually trying to bring to the table at that time, in late 2011. So um, the interesting thing about Occupy in Wellington is that of this more than 70 people who I spoke to on, that, on, the, on the first day, uh, pretty much everyone had heard about Occupy through social media, especially you know, uh, from Occupy websites, from Facebook, from Twitter. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's possible that, that one understands the significance of Occupy in in those virtual terms. I'll, I'll, I'll get back to this point in a second. So um, it's clear that, <clears throat> that the protest meant multiple things to multiple people in multiple locations. But throughout my engagement, it was equally clear that participants themselves were not ambiguous about what they thought the protest was about. Right? That is to say that you, know, you, you may have big, broad, ambiguous frames for for protests, but there are specific um, causes and issues that people are bringing to, to, to the table. That is, the polysemy is not on the part of the uh, part of the of, of uh, individual activists. It's of a, it's of a dis different register altogether. So while some people carried signs that that use their own ideas and language and ex they explained the meanings of these of these frames purely in terms of local justice issues. Others made signs that were much were creative and original, made connections between local issues and um, and global ones, uh, and the global economic concerns in particular of the Occupy movement. Still others carried signs that appropriated or reproduced global frames in the form of the worldwide movement, but then uh, discussed in detail how those issues were relevant to our terror. And finally, if some people um, use the movement's global slogans to talk about global issues rather than local ones. So he he here are a couple of examples just to animate this. Um, so if, if you look at this first sign, which is how to vote out New Zealand's uh, inside jobbers, you know, the sign and the issue are, of course, sort of both local. That is to it there about the, on, the, the then controversy, which seems to have died, over the panel that was appointed to review decisions that were made about earthquake recovery in the Canterbury region. Right? And specifically, when you think about Jerry Brownlee's appointing four people onto that panel, uh, including Jenny Shipley, paying them more than $1,000 a day. Right, I mean, so that was what was animating this particular concern. Right, so um, another one, um, no more usury, corruption, and greed. So uh, this was um, a, a, a protest, uh, 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 an expression of outrage about what, what sort of bailouts Bill English was offering to um, South Canterbury. Right. And, uh, and, and the person who held the sign or who was talking about it was saying that, in essence, every single person in this country has paid about $400 for that bailout, for that one particular firm. Um, <clears throat> another example, um, and this is, uh, this is Me no hotahi tena pia katika, which is, you know, if you come sit by me, everything will become all right. You know, which uh, to me sort of sort of this evocative, rich, um, on one hand, it's an appropriation of sort of, of the idea, of spatial idea of occupation, but it's made sensible only because it's here, right? Um, and, oh, and, and, and here's, here, here, here is sort of the 99% slogans that actually, as the day went on, that first day, the interesting thing was that the global slogans became more and more prominent. You know, that morning, a lot of people brought a diverse range of slogans and issues to the table, but 
the, the frames of the global movement became more prevalent throughout the day. So, um, and this is obviously il um, illustrated in the production of signs and uh, placards. Um, and so I guess, you know, in that sense, you would say, yeah, there was a networking large get work here. But again, this misses an important part of what happened with Occupy, or indeed with a lot of protests regarding digital technology, in that it's not just in contemporary technologies are not um, purely about networking. Uh, they are they're also driven by what one might call a logic of aggregation. You know, and by logic of aggregation, what I mean <coughs> is that technologies produce people in places. Right? They actually literally produce them there. Right? So whether or not that, 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 you know, that, that production is for political ends or, um, or for friendship or for sex, uh, the, you know, technology produces people in places in, 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 in altogether more fluid ways than, than we're used to, right? So, um, and this in turn, I think, sort of points to a really important but often invisible aspect of protest. So as participants and Occupy spent more time with each other, then the protest became, in addition, just not just a visible expression of dissatisfaction, but a crucial site for organizing itself. Right? And a means by which activists were able to communicate and negotiate what the protest itself meant. Right? That is, um, <clears throat> and this is an important point to remember, I think, in, co in the context of the fact that one of the big critiques of Occupy is that, well, there are no goals. Well, of course there were no goals, because you know, that, that was the first time people were actually getting together. So what, what, the, what technology seems to have done in this case is flip the relationship between organizing and protest. Right? That is, you might say that in an earlier generation, uh, the protest was an outcome of a lot of activist organizing. Over here, the protest inaugurated a lot of organizing. Right. So in that sense, you know, there, there, there is a bit of a flip. So um, <clears throat> I, I know from being part of the Global Occupy Research Collective that the notion of emergent democracy appeared to characterize a lot of activist discourse in various locations in the Occupy movement around the world. But I think that notion of, of, of emergent democracy, at least in Wellington, um, appeared to have been particularly significant and effective. And un unlike a lot of other places, two weeks after the initial protest, the number of tents in Civic Square grew from 2 to 30 and I think sort of peaked at around, around 60. And that kind of effective mobilization, I think, can be attributed to the successful first day of protests and the marches that followed in subsequent days. Um, so <clears throat> just a couple of issues that I think might further help develop understanding how contemporary oh, activism yeah. is sort of simultaneously virtual and organic. Um, uh, first, I suppose I'd say that the proliferation of signs reproduced from um, Zuccotti Park um, across the world in the global Occupy movement, my apologies, I keep getting ahead of my slides, mm -hmm. um, are further evidence of the impact that digital technologies have on the spread of social movements. Uh, however, Ways in which participants align their own organic micro-level frames with the more global movement frames are quite diverse. So it's common to see the mingling of local and global issues, micro and macro, in ways that are not simply aligned. Rather, local and global issues are both rendered sensible by this kind of intermingling. And this intermingling, I don't think, can be understood in terms of the personalization of contemporary social movements that movement scholars such as Lance Bennett or Alexandra Siegerberg talk about. That is, people were not communicating some kind of personal expressive ideal as the result of their engagement with the polysemic master frame. Instead, they were articulating what they considered to be important social issues that affected not only them, but a range of people. Connecting the ecological and economic havoc that a careless oil spill from a tanker can have in a small region with larger neoliberal policies about trade laws, insurance, and limited liability is not personalizing an issue, right? It's being able to see the systematic interrelations between different forms of economic justice, and as such, it's a form of conscientization. Okay, so another implication. Framing dynamics at Occupy also say some interesting things about the multiplicity and complexity of frames and social movements. So they, as, as, as you've seen, there were clearly multiple frames 
um, that characterize the movement with some evidence of increasing convergence during the day. Um, and it is, I suppose, however, however, it is more plausible to understand the global collective action frames that were developed for the Occupy movement uh, in, encapsulated in the idea uh, of occupying or claiming space, or we are the 99%, as being broad and inclusive rather than ambiguous or pollicimous. And I think there are certainly grounds for, for resisting the idea that, fra that global movement frames are always polysimous. Uh, and I think that was uh, really evident when participants at Occupy rallied around the idea that, that Occupy demands were really sort of a return to grassroots democracy, you know, for the people, by the people, and an economic system that works f for 100% of the people. So, so finally, I'd say that Occupy casts um, interesting light on both what you might call um, thin and thick ties in contemporary activist organizing. So the degree of participant involvement in the Occupy movement via social media certainly indicates both interest in and engagement with issues involving social justice. Uh, it was also obvious, though, that affinity group involvements in the protests were not why people had participated. Rather, it was sort of some thin virtual ties that they developed that, that brought them there in the first place. So, um, so I guess what, for me, the deliverable is that we know then that thin ties can be effective in the process of initially organizing a protest, but to move that beyond, you know, critiques of digital activism as being clicktivism or slacktivism. Um, what is equally important is the develop, uh, development of, um, of uh, relationships between key organizers that happen after the aggregation. Right? So um, in that sense, I would say that long-term collective engagement with needs for social, cultural, and material transformation continues to be facilitated by the development of, of close communicative ties between core organizers, even though even, you know, whether or not these organizers are co-located or whether or not they are diffused. The point is that relationships have to be, um, have to be um, thick, right? They have to be complex. They have to be relational. They can't be random and dispersed. Um, <clears throat> So I'd say that eventually it may be that contemporary social movements need both thin ties as well as thick ties between core participants in the developing stages in order to grow. And I guess we can talk more about how Occupy sort of continues to register here in this regard, you know, not only in instrumental terms, but also in affective or even constitutive terms. So... Um, that then is sort of a, 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 a bit of a pushback against this idea of the new dialogic, sort of, and I suppose sort of a, a call on my part to, to actually sort of be more historic and more situated about how we understand what counts as uh, both activist organizing as well as activism itself. So um, I want now to reflect on the idea that if considering activist communication in terms of the new dialogic em emphasizes a, a specific networking logic of connectivity on the one hand, but on the other, if activist communication is altogether more complex and relational on the other, how do we consider dialogue more broadly in the context of activism? Okay, so I would propose that instead of examining dialogue on the fringes of activist work, uh, looking for consen understanding it in terms of consensus or collaboration-oriented activist methods, that we treat dialogue as altogether more central and focus on the dialogic potential of activist contention itself. So um, the relationship between um, dialogue and what we call activism can, after all, be cast in different ways. Um, how much time do I have left, Osan? We still have, like, around 15 minutes. <laughs> Oh, cool. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll go into this. So, <clears throat> um, sometimes theorists um, treat collaboration and consensus as defining features of dialogue, or any kind of dialogue. When this happens, several views of activism, um, uh, or rather the relationship between activism and dialogue become apparent. First, um, when you understand dialogue in terms of collaboration or even consensus, then you often implicitly privilege dialogue 
and cast it in oppositional terms with activism. Okay? Second, you privilege activist dialogic methods understood in terms of collaboration um, over contestation or challenging. Um, and third, you could dichotomize activist communication itself in terms of talking about dialogue as being internal to activist, to activist circles and confrontation or contention to be external. And so this is what happens when you have a view of dialogue as, uh, as purely collaborative. Um, it's also possible to understand dialogue as a form of communication that co-opts activists altogether. That is, uh, the invitation for activists to engage in dialogue with the state or with a corporation or with um, you know, a, a polluting mining company um, can be understood as a way of co-opting them and neutralizing them and then dismissing them. Okay? And in that sense, dialogue is treated as a fragile and risky kind of communication for activists um, as a source of legitimacy for corporate or state domination, and, or, or maybe even as sort of an impossibility because it's so risky. Okay. Um, a third point of view on dialogue, however, is, is agonistic, and this is, I guess, you know, theoretically where I draw a lot from, from Move's work on, um, on agonism. But without being, um, being especially theoretical about it, what I uh, suffice to say that when you treat dialogue, dialogue itself as agonistic and multivocal, then dialogue and contention can be either be understood as distinct forms that are diachronically intertwined, or you could understand contention itself, including protests and other seemingly asymmetrical or persuasive communication practices, you can understand that itself as dialogic. Okay? And that's where I want to go. So, because when we do this, we center openness rather than consensus as a key construct in activist practice. So an agonistic perspective on dialogue will significantly challenge what might construe as collaborative openness itself. Okay? So while a collaboration-oriented point of view, as well as a critical perspective on dialogue as co-optation, uh, might construe openness as a form of consensus or a form of vulnerability, an agonistic point of view would admit many more features of that kind of material or discursive openness, which might include um, caution, deliberation, unpredictability, awareness, presence, visibility. So I'll go into just a couple of these so that there's a bit of time for discussion. So if one understands um, openness in terms of a, win a willingness to deliberate or explain a communicative explanation, then it can be positioned, deliberation itself can be positioned as an attempt to establish differences in the face of presumed unity, which is a dangerous form of discursive closure. Okay, so creating distinctions between groups is itself a kind of opening um, of space. So here's an example. A couple of years ago, uh, last, last year, um, the Indian Supreme Court uh, reinstated, reinstated, reinstated um, Section 377, which describes um, homosexuality as illegal. I mean, there's, the, the 377 clause is sort of this infamous colonial device that actually exists in, it, in, in a number of different constitutions in, um, in Asia and um, in, in, in Africa, um, in one form or the other. Uh, but th there was a lot of outrage about it. A lot of queer activists uh, were understandably extremely upset about it. A lot of people wrote op-eds. I wrote an op-ed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, when I went to Bangalore uh, later that year and attended a, a, a sort of a bit of a sort of a, a, po a political what do we do next discussion, then what became apparent that was for a lot of trans activists, uh, 377 was not even an issue. You know, and it was that kind of deliberation between the different people who had an investment in um, understanding fair rights or civil rights that it was with that kind of establishment of difference that, that I think um, um, significantly informed how uh, mainstream gay and queer activists themselves decided to proceed on, the, on that issue this year. Right? So it's in that sense that um, that was disagreement, but it was deliberative 
and it opened rather than closed action. Okay? So um, a second kind of openness that, 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 I'm, that I'd like to outline is, I guess, what um, um, I would call um, pragmatic caution in practice. That is, this can take the form of either cautious confrontation or cautious cooperation. Okay? And this, I guess, sort of um, pragmatic caution is important because it might prevent co-optation or rigid kinds of antagonism. Um, and uh, maybe then ultimate marginalization, right? In other words, alternating contestation with, collab with attempts at collaboration can actually be really useful for activists. Okay, so um, a third kind of openness uh, I would call sort of openness as um, unpredictability, right? And by this, I suppose, if one refers, I refer to the, the dialogic and multivocal character of a protest itself, right, in terms of a completely uncertain or unpredictable outcome of, uh, of getting people together. I think that th that's particularly important in an era when, when people come together because they don't quite know what they need to do, need to do together, but uh, anything could happen thereafter. Right. So, um, and finally, I, I want to understand openness just in terms of awareness and visibility of issues themselves. You know, in that sense, the the... The, the very existence of several social movements, regardless of their reformative or revolutionary or orientation, helps create um, cultural discourses and hopefully, eventually, a counter-narrative about the inevitability of such things as, say, financial austerity. You know, so, so, for example, one, one movement that I've, that, that I've worked a little with is um, the, the Transition Town Movement, which is, you know, which, which, which started in Ireland in 2006, and um, there are several transition town centers in, in, in Aotearoa. And one of the things that I find especially intriguing about transition towns is, even though it is, it's, it's largely reformative in its orientation, the fact that it flips f uh, financial discourse um, is, I think, um, pretty profound. It is so for, so th um, the fact that it understands um, environmental resources as finite and financial resources as infinite, I think is a pretty significant discursive sh shift. And in terms of um, uh, the possibility that it might create some kind of discursive or material opening, uh, I think um, is something that we could possibly hold out for. So um, I suppose I, I, I'll, I'll sort of br bring things to a close here. I've covered quite a lot of ground. Uh, I'll, I'll simply close by saying that openness can be engendered, I think, as much through um, debate, discussion, struggle, contention, as it can through, um, through narrow forms of collaboration. And um, as academics, what, uh, one of the things that I'm committed to um, is uh, to continue to work to understand um, the kind of radical openness that activist organizing continues to potentialize. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.